such a beautiful day today, this Sunday, the middle of the year, right here on this hot summer day. Welcome to Right Direction Baptist Church. My name is D. James Courtney, pastor here. Today, I want to invite you to hear this message that is called the goal is godliness. Stay tuned and God bless you. Amen. Now, turn with me in your Bibles, please, to 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter. I'll know you have it because I'll see you standing with me to your feet for the reading of God's word. Amen. 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter. One of two letters written from Paul to Timothy. Amen. And we're going to start at the sixth verse. Amen. If you have it, say amen. amen. Verse six says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourishing up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' tales, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now, Timothy, bodily exercise profiteth a little bit, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to help us in your word today. For living godliness is not always easy. I know that we like to say that we got the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost will make it easy. But I don't see that in the word. I see that it will definitely be of a help. He is going to be our comfort and our helper. But as long as life is life, it may not always be as easy. And so we do need your help. We do need the Holy Ghost. In Jesus name, thank you for your word. Amen. You may be seated by the grace of God. Amen. I won't keep you alone today, I don't think. Amen. I'd like to talk with you on the subject today. The goal is godliness. The goal is godliness. I need you to understand that the, the title is not called The Goal May Be Godliness. I am not telling you that the goal should be godliness. But I want you to understand that the goal is godliness. Now, I know today, as I talk to the Lord about just now, it really isn't that easy with all that the world has to offer. There's so many things that goes on in 2022, even so much more today than it was 30 or 40 years ago. It seems like with new technology comes new problems. Let me give you something simple. I might get, you know, somebody might ridicule me about this later, but it's just the truth. You, I remember in the 80s, if you wanted to see something nasty, profane, nude, you had to go into a store and you had to purchase it from the back of the counter. Y'all remember those days? They had it covered up there. You can only see the name of it, but you couldn't see what was under it. Back then, for the young folks that's listening, those were called magazines. Y'all probably don't know what that is these days. If you wanted to do something, you had to really plan this thing out and had to go to the library and read in order to understand. 
But you fast forward to today with the advance of phones and technology, computers, laptops, and iPads, and all these different things. Now, it's just a touch of a button. Isn't it amazing that back when I was in school, I better had to carry two quarters for emergencies. I had a teacher named Miss Floyd. I was, this was in high school. And she used to always say that you should always, this was in high school now, you should always have at least two quarters on you in case you run into emergencies. And I remember telling people that were younger than me that same thing. And make sure you have two quarters on you. You never know when there's something that might happen and you need to use the phone. But back then, there was a pay phone on almost every other corner. And you can just go and use the pay phone. Fast forward to the day. If there is a pay phone, it's broke. It's not going to work. But it doesn't matter because even the smallest of babies have court, uh, uh, pay phone, uh, cell phones now. I don't know how I got along without a cell phone. I can't figure it out. Because today, even parents, the very parents that got along without cell phones, oh, I got to get my baby a cell phone now because, you know, I don't know what might happen. Now, back in the day, they didn't have no cell phones. I ain't have no cell phone. I got along just fine. I might have, it might have was a little bit more inconvenient, but I got along. But why, why did I get along just fine? Because I kept my two quarters in my pocket if I ever ran into an emergency. And don't get me wrong, because I'm not down in a knocking cell phones. We all use them, and they are convenient. They are they do us so well. Yes, it does eliminate all the opportunities of going to the library. But you can about look on. You can look up a book and read it on your phone now. So it's okay. The problem is, with good comes to bad. Because those very bad things I talked about in the beginning. Now even kids unfortunately can get to it just as easy as you can. And sure, we say that we believe that we are, oh, my child, my child won't, my child, never say what your child won't do. Because as long as they got a cell phone, there's a lot of opportunities awaiting them, good and bad. But these type things does make it a little harder to live godly, doesn't it? Can we be honest? Can, can we talk honestly a minute? I know some of you, you've been doing this so long, and you might not even have cell phones these days. I don't know. So y'all probably doing all right. Bro, watch. You got your cell phone? Oh, yeah. But I'm going to be honest. With, with us, it's a little harder now because of so many opportunities of doing the wrong things. I want you to know, though, that just because we have cell phones now doesn't mean we didn't have our bad opportunities before cell phones. And I would even go so back as far as to say that Paul said even way back then before a wall phone and fiber optics was done back then, before my bell came along, even back then, they were wrestling with issues. I remember in the 70s that we would come home from church, and I used to stay with Auntie Carrie, Aunt Carrie. And every day after church, after, every Sunday after church, she'd come home, and she'd call Sister Wilcox. I hope nobody knows these folks. They passed on now. And guess what they used to do when they used to pick up the phone? Not the cell phone, because cell phones weren't made back then. They used to pick up that phone. Child, why that woman had on what she had on in church on Sunday? Who told her to wear that? And she know that hat didn't even match with them shoes that she had on. And you know that her husband sleeping around around there with Susan May around the corner, don't you? But I'm just telling you so we can pray about it, not for any other reason. 
We need to pray about it. Yeah, even in the 70s, we had our issues of having to deal with some things. But Paul, 2,000 years ago, said there were issues back then. There were dangers back then. The church was young in its infancy. You're talking about 30-something years old only at the time. And compared to 2,000-plus years now, but the church was very young. And Paul was saying, look, we have some dangers going on, Timothy. Now, you are preaching over here. You are pastoring this church over here in Ephesus, and you need to be aware of these things, Timothy. You can't be timid. You can't be scared because fear is not given to you. He says, and you've got to understand there are some dangers going on. There are some problems that, that, is, that the church is facing today. There's a lot of lies and a lot of hypocrisy according to chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. There's a lot of lying going on saying that, that you shouldn't marry when uh, God never said that. There, there's a lot, of, a lot of abstaining from foods that God never said that you had to do. I know. Let me let me read that verse. because Some of y'all looking at me like crazy because y'all saying, wait a minute, in the pastor, because I thought we ain't supposed to eat pork. Well, I don't know about you, but I love my little pork rib. But I'm not Jewish, so I don't know. But the scripture here, the scripture here says, I'm just saying what I'm reading here in verse three in chapter four. Y'all can look at it with me. It says, forbid not forbidding to marry. Let me back up. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Verse three, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from each which God created. Somebody say created. Yes. Created to be received with thanksgiving. Then he skips down, he says in verse 4, for every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused, including my pork rib and chitterlings. Uh, it is to be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified. Uh, can y'all imagine my real being sanctified <laughs> by the word of God and prayer? That's why you better say grace for you eat. <laughs> While I'm having a good time, the scripture is true. That we have to be careful because there are even today a lot of uh, uh, lies and wives tales put out over the pulpit about what you should and should not do. One of the biggest things I hear preachers doing is telling married people what they can and can't do in the bed. Hold on now. If the Bible is silent, then I'm silent. The Bible says marriage is and the bed is. Now, barring bringing anybody else aside from you and your wife in the bed, let me put that out there. Whatever you and your wife do is what you and your wife do. Whatever you and your husband do, and I mean husband and wife. Let me try to clarify that. You do what you do because that is what God has allowed you to do in marriage. Nobody better not come in my... Y'all got me talking bad now. I, you, no one should ever come in my room telling me what I can and can't do up in my room. And I'm going to hold it right there since I'm a preacher. Yes, Lord. Yeah, yeah. You see, there was a lot of things going on. And because of that, people were living out of the means of what they were called to live. On one end, you got people saying you can do everything. And God never said that. And then on the other end, they said you can't do anything. And God never said that. So you have to be careful with the lies that are even brought forth, even in the pulpit. Yes, I'm a preacher like you're supposed to be preached. You got to understand that lies. I think some people think that the pastor will get struck down in the pulpit if he tell a lie. And Bob never said that either. He could tell a lie as good from the pulpit as he can from the street. Well, it's true. 
this is a holy area. It's supposed to be a sacred place. But I've known many words that have come across pulpits that were nowhere near holy and nowhere near sacred. I've heard everything from cussing the line from the pulpit. We have to understand what it is to be godly. Godliness is not making up things like the Pharisees did to try to prove their godliness. You see, I don't have to prove my godliness to you. I know y'all may not want to hear that. But I have to prove my godliness to you. You see, if I live godly for the one I'm supposed to be living godly for, then you're going to see the fruit that I bear. But if you've gone and made up some stuff that you think that should be done in the Bible, that's not there. And I don't do what you want me to do, i.e. eat my pork rib. But I can't blame you. I can't blame me for your miscoming of the word. I can't do it. Now, understand there are some things that I know that I should not do. Paul said there are some things that I don't need to do in front of new Christians. I can't drink my wine in front of you. You might be a recovering alcoholic trying to live this life of holiness. I can't do that. And let me tell you, the difference between a mature Christian and an immature Christian is the immature Christian says, well, I should be able to do what I want to do. The mature Christian says, I might be able to do it, but I'm going to watch what I do because there's other people watching me and I don't want to set a bad influence. That's a mature Christian right there. I'm not telling you that you can't do it. I'm saying that you should know when and when not to do it. That makes sense, right? Now, I know some people may not like that word I just gave, but Paul said it, so don't be mad at me. He said it in his word, in this word here. All right? So my godliness is not following your words of the Bible. My godliness pertains to the words of God that he gave to these great people in the Bible. Are you walking with me? That's what makes godliness godliness. Because if I follow your words, Sister Banks, then I won't be godly. I'll be Lindley. <laughs> that was cute, wasn't it? <laughs> and while being Lindley is not a bad thing, don't get me wrong. My goal is not to live lindily, but my goal is to what? Live godly. And that is my goal for today. Now, our goal today is to understand what the word is saying concerning living godly. Three things I want you to get today. I want you to get the prophet of godliness, the prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T, the prophet of godliness, the promise of godliness, and the payment of for godliness. Those are the three things I want you to get today. Take a look at your scripture. We're dealing with Timothy. Remember, he was a preacher. He was a minister unto Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something. I don't care what title a person has. We all are deduced down to one thing. We all are ministers unto Christ. We all are ministers unto the gospel. I can never have such a high title that I cannot serve you. I cannot have such a high title that I can't help you in your time of need. All of my suits and all of my big hats and all of my robes and all of my uh, my uh, or, ornate, or, or, ornate gatherings upon my body does not make me higher than you. As a matter of fact, if anything, I am under you to lift you up in my service to you. Let me make sure that's clear. Because, see, we got this idea that uh, if I don't, uh, see, my name is Darrell James Courtney. God happened to call me as a pastor. That's what I do. All right? My calling is no greater than your calling. I know I'm going somewhere. You're saying, where is this coming from? But this is important. This is very important. My calling is no greater than your calling. Because if all of us do what we're called to do in our calling, what a great kingdom of God it will be. 
We're so busy looking at those that we think are higher and finding ways to bring them lower because of the mess they've done. Let me tell you something. I got sin all up in here that I have to fight every day. I have to fight it every day just like you. I am no different than you. I have to fight this stuff like you do every day. I have to kill this flesh every day. I may not sin on a regular basis, but believe you me, I have to fight. So if you're looking for a pastor that's perfect, don't come through these doors. If you're looking for a pastor that is striving to be godly, these are the doors you might want to come through. All right? Why am I saying that? It's important that you understand that if I can help you in, through my goal of being godliness, godly through this word, then we all might get somewhere. The first thing I need you to understand from these dangers that are put upon us, the first thing is the prophet of godliness. Well, let's take a look at verse 6. It says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance, the remembrance of what? That there are dangers going on in the church, according to verse 1 through 5. Those same things I called out earlier. If, I put, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, then that would make you a good minister, Timothy. You see, making, you, me, making me a good minister is not me telling you how much money you can get. Making you a good minister, making me a good minister is not me telling you that you can get this house that you want, that, that God is going to bless you with this coin. God is going to bless you with this. Sure, wonderful. God may tell me to tell some of you that, but let me tell you something. That is not what makes me a minister, and that doesn't even make me a prophet. What makes me a minister is being true to this word and reminding you that out here in this world, there are dangers that you have to be aware of. In the church house, there are dangers that you have to be aware of. That's what made Timothy a good minister, and that is what will make me a good minister, a servant of God, a servant of you. That's what will do it. Not me trying to get you to get a line and get all this money. That prophet is not going to do me any good if I'm not doing what God says to do. And I'm not telling you that every preacher that might do that is a bad preacher. I'm only telling you we got to get our priorities in order. Sometimes I think we miss that. The Bible says that uh, you will be a good minister of Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. You see, that's my goal, is to teach you good doctrine. That's, right. that's, right. that's, right. that's my goal. Yeah. Because, see, that's where I'm going to get my profit from, is to give you good doctrine. Yeah. Not give you some stuff that's going to make me look good. Not give you some stuff that's going to fill this church. Uh-oh. I know it got a little quiet there, didn't it? You see, I, I pray the Lord will bless even with the larger church uh, 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 in right direction or what have you. But my, here's my thing. I'm going to do it the way God says to do it and not with words that are going to make people come out. Because, see, how you, how you get them is how you're going to keep them. If I get you lying, then I'm going to have to keep you lying. And at some point, I'm going to get some kind of conviction since I am saved. And I might want to start telling the truth. And them same folk that came because of a lie going to find another church down the street, around the corner somewhere, that's going to give them an even better lie. And bye-bye to my big church. And again, I'm not saying all big churches lie. I'm just saying I don't want to get one for that reason. I want to do it the right way if I get it, if the Lord blesses that way. Then he goes on to say in verse 7, but refuse profane and old wise fables. In other words, don't let the mess out in the street come in the church. Don't let the gossip in the street come in the church. Don't let what used to... Watch this. Who remember WPDQ? Some of y'all remember that radio station, don't you? I remember in the 70s listening as a kid, as a kid, as a kid when I was a kid on, on Sunday mornings. They would have all kinds of uh, programs on, the wonderful Sunday morning programs. But they would also have Reverend Ike. This is Reverend Ike. You can't lose with the stuff I use. 
And I don't know if you know, but not all of Reverend Ike's messages were scriptural. But here's the curious thing. Some of you all may remember the name Madam Ruby. She's still in existence today, by the way. On Sunday mornings in the 70s and the 80s, her commercials used to be on during church services and, 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 and gospel music on a Sunday morning. Now, y'all, y'all, y'all looking at me crazy. But if you recall, Rev, uh, uh, Madam Ruby is and was a soothsayer. She read your fortune. She read your palm. Much like Miss Cleo before she passed away with her 1 900 number. And I know one of three y'all done called to get y'all. Hallelujah. I just need to see what the Lord going to say. They got a thousand dollar bill because every day you trying to call seeing what Madam, what uh, uh, Miss Cleo got to say to you. But that's a whole different conversation. My point to you is this. Even on Sunday mornings when it was supposed to be, they would mix soothsaying into the program. Not just WPDQ, but a lot of the Christian, the gospel radio stations. Why? Because it was accepted, Deacon. Because that was what they did. You see, you could not sweep out a certain way of a house unless there was some bad luck involved. You can't waste salt on the table unless you're picking up and throwing something behind your back. Now understand, this is Christians that was dealing with this. And I will venture to say, even today, one or three, y'all still take a little less salt when it weighs. I'm preaching. Y'all may not realize it. And for some of y'all that don't understand what I'm saying, that's all right. Y'all do. Y'all that do, y'all know what I'm talking about. Can't step on, on cracks. You can't uh, walk in the path of a black cat. You can't. Uh, walk under a ladder. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, the truth is, if you walk under a ladder, well, you probably might be in some danger. <laughs> so you probably don't want to do that anyway. But not because of a supernatural issue. But if somebody got a paint can up above your head and you hit it, well, now it could cause an unconscious situation going on if it knocks you on your head. So stay away from that. That's probably a true one right there. But my, my, my thing that I'm trying to tell you is it's mixed up even in the church. Now, if, that's not, if I didn't give you enough proof, then I don't know what is. Even to this day, now you have them bringing in that, well, no, Jesus was black or Jesus was white or Jesus uh, uh, wasn't Jesus. It was a whole nother person or Y'all looking at the wrong person or you an Israelite because of your color or this, that, or the other. Let me tell you something. You have to take this Bible for what it is. Yes, There's a scripture that says, try the spirits. No, it does not. Stop. Now, Sister Banks, I know you know you've been in Bible study too much. You'll find me one scripture in the Bible that says, try the spirit by the spirit. That's what it was. That's why you got to be careful. Right there. This what this Bible study right here, what we're talking about. Understand. The Bible says, try the spirits and see. You see, because you have to understand anything that goes on that, that comes to you, you measure it by this. This is your measuring rod. The Bible call, I mean, the, there is a word called the canon, which means to measure, and this is your measuring rod. This is your canon. This is what you measure, everything that comes through. You cipher it through this Bible, and if it ain't right, throw it out. This is how you try the spirit that's coming to you. It's through the word of God. Go read the scripture for yourself in 1 John. You'll see it. We've got to understand this, that there's a lot of things that will always try to come through to penetrate the church. That's why we got the problems we got now. 
and can't get some stuff straightened out. And then he goes on to say, it says, refuse uh, uh, old wise tales and, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Don't exercise yourself in what this world is trying to get you to bring in. Don't exercise yourself in what other people are trying to think and bring into the church, but exercise yourself in godliness the way this word says to do. But then the last thing I want to deal with in, as far as, as, far as uh, profiting is verses 8. Verse 8, it says, for ex bodily exercise, profit of a little. Now, you know, there was a time that people did not exercise because of this verse. Isn't that crazy? They didn't. This is their get out of jail free card right here. I don't got to exercise. The Bible says exercise profit of a little. This is not what I'm supposed to do. Let me tell you something that has nothing to do with saying that you don't exercise a little. If you want to keep some decent health, you better get out here and walk. You better get out here and jog. You better get out here and un, two, three, one, two, two, three. You better do something to keep this body moving, though it will stop on you. And as a matter of fact, I would venture to say Paul wouldn't have ever said that anyway because Paul was an avid walker. He walked everywhere. Hundreds of miles did he walk to get this word of God out. Hundreds of miles. You got to remember, even before his salvation point, he was one of those, uh, like a lot of them, that was in the Colosseums watching these brawny, strong men fight fight these animals and, and uh, ride these chariots and these gladiators. They, they were big. And, so that was a popular thing back then. And even just like now, they were worried about weight then when they were dealing with that. But Paul says, look, that looks good because you understand you're dealing with Ephesus, right? He, Timothy, was a preacher in Ephesus. They had columns in Ephesus. And guess what? The people used to love going to, I wonder does this sound familiar? People used to like going at a certain day of the week to go see at the Colosseum these big brawny men fight against each other, go against each other. I wonder what that sounds like. They would miss their godly doings in order to be able to go. I wonder what that sounds like. Isn't it interesting that you will find less men in church in the fall and winter of a Sunday morning than any other time? And probably it may not have anything to do with it. Probably it's because of those big, brawny, strong men in the Coliseums fighting against one another as a team trying to see who can get the most points with a little old pea skin ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, we got to put this thing in real perspective. You see, we got the same problems today as they did then. Yeah. All this exercising is good and they brawny and I'm going to be like them when I grow up. And you got even young boys growing up trying to play football, doing that very same thing. And these, these older men are keeping these younger men out of church because they want to make sure they watch what they see on TV and go out and play ball, miss Bible study for practices. And I'm not telling you that it's, it's something wrong with it, but we have to keep things in perspective. We have to keep this life in priority. That is all Paul is trying to tell us here. Look, I understand you might like the Coliseum. I understand you might want to watch football, but keep your life in priority. Keep your life in perspective. When it comes to the big picture of things, exercise is profit of only a little bit. But you got to exercise godliness. Exercise how God says to do things. Exercise doing how he, what he called you to do. Exercise following his will and his way. Exercise understanding, picking up this word and reading his word, studying to show yourself approved. This is what he is trying to tell us. Not that exercising is not good for us, but it is, it, we have to keep it in perspective. That's all he's trying to tell us. Exercise profitable, but godly... This is profitable in all things. What you don't realize is there's a life after this life. There's a, there's a, there's a life after this life. 
Exercising your body will be good for this life only. And that's only a maybe. But exercising in God, and this is not only good for this life, it's good for the next also. You see, because there are still rewards waiting on you. I hope you're walking with me on this. I know that this is a tough one to get through, but the truth is we tend to put everything on everything else except for what we need to put it on. In other words, somebody said we major in the minors and minor in the majors. And we have to be careful of that. We have to put things in perspective. Why? Because there is a promise, the promise of godliness. Because, again, there is a life after death. There is a life. Take a look at the scripture here. He says, he says, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of that life that now is and of that that is which is to come. Now, here's the problem. People have this idea that the 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 uh, the promise of good life is money, things. God is going to give you this and God is going to give you that. Uh, I wonder, did Paul really mean that while he was in prison all those times because he was doing what God told him to do? Uh, I wonder, was Peter understanding that scripture the same way, even though Peter had so much persecution against him and ended up being hung on the cross upside down? I, uh, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if 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 uh, John uh, believed that same thing, even though John was was uh, uh, was placed on an, on the Isle of Patmos. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. No, obviously, there has to be more than just things. I, I believe he really was talking about the whole peace within, giving you a peace above all understanding. You can have all the money in you, that you want, but be miserable because you have no peace. You can have all the peace that you want and be just fine without any money. You better understand what I'm saying. It's not all about the stuff. It's about the peace that God gives you. It's about the calmness and tranquility. You see, a lot of us fight for the wrong things. We, we fight for cars and we fight for houses. What about fighting for some peace? So the promise is simple. He's saying that there's a life that is now, but there's a life after also. Smoking or non-smoking, your choice. But that's what it comes down to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Either we decide we're going to live this life and be able to receive the goodness of God even after. See, that's why Paul, when he said to live in, is Christ and to die is gain, this is what he was talking about. But but for, for, for time's sake, let's move on. It goes on, uh, it goes on to, say, to say that, uh, um, verse 9, it is a faithful saying, the, the same thing we just talked about. It's a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation. For therefore, we both labor and suffer. He's talking about him, Paul, and Timothy. We both out here doing the same thing. We both out here laboring for the Lord, and we're having to suffer because of it. In other words, young man. You're going through this as a preacher, but you're not the only one. Some of you out here, you're going through things in your life, and you wonder if you're the only one. You're not the only one. See, the promise is God will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, the promise of this godliness is that, that, that you will be able to have someone here to hold your hand all the way through the issues that you may have to deal with. But it doesn't talk, stop there. The last thing is the payment for godliness. You see, this godly life that we're called to live, yeah. you know, there was, there was somebody paid for that. Yeah. It might have came to you for free, yeah. but somebody had to pay for it. Yeah. Somebody had to pay for this salvation. Yeah. Oh, I feel, I feel it coming. Now, somebody yeah. had to pay for this salvation. Yeah. Somebody yeah. had to pay for this possibility of living godly yeah. for you. You couldn't do it because you couldn't afford it. You couldn't do it because you didn't have the means to do it. Your blood wasn't clean enough to do it. You had too much sin already on you. You couldn't do it. You couldn't pay for it even if they held a gun to your head and told you to. There was only one that was able 
to pay for it on your behalf. Take a look at the scripture. It goes on to say in verse 10, it says, because we trust in what? The living God. Who? The living God. Who is the Savior for all men? You see, God knew that you couldn't do it. God knew that you didn't have the ability to live this life. He knew that the blood that you had wasn't going to be able to suffice. And the blood of these animals that was killed every year was only going to take you so far. He needed to be a Savior, a man that was going to be pure, a man that had no sin upon him. And God said, I can't find it in Susan May. I can't find it in Harry. I can't find find it in Brother Watts. I can't find it in Brother Jackson. I can't find it even in Sister Sabrina. I can't find it in Darrell. I can't find it in Macaulay. So I can't, and they can't do it. If it's going to be done right, I got to do it myself. So he took himself and he made himself into a man. And he brought us down and his name was Jesus. And he lived this life showing us how to live it perfectly Nobody else could do it. He is the Savior of all men. And understand, he didn't die for just y'all that believed. He died for y'all who didn't believe too. Watch this. Take a look at the scripture. It says, uh, who is Savior unto all men, especially of those that believe. Now, he's not, I'm not telling you that if you don't believe in Christ, you go to heaven. I'm saying if you don't believe in Christ, you got a chance to. That's what I mean right now. You see, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, I don't care who you are, I don't care your background, I don't care how much money you got, I don't care if your hair is wavy like mine, I don't care what you got going on, Whosoever, you could be black or you could be white, you could be Chinese, you could be Japanese. But whatever you got going on, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, that's the Savior that I serve. I couldn't pay it for myself. It wasn't about the skin color. It wasn't about how much money I got. But it was all about the blood. I can't do it because my blood wasn't right. Who wants to wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What will make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, I owe it to him to live right. I owe it to him to live holy. I owe it to him to live godly. I make my mistakes. I even make my errors. But I owe it to him. Y'all like to say in the song, I owe God all the praise. We owe God a whole lot more than praise. He's the only one that was able to walk this world. He's the only one that was able to take our sins upon him. Hanging on that cross. Our hands, his hands held out. His feet nailed low. And he died at 3 o'clock for me and for you. But y'all know what we like to say up here in the Baptist church. Three days later, when the dude was still on the road, he got up out that grave with all power in his hand. And he gave a little bit of that power to me. And he gave a little bit of that power to you. And he gave it to you and to you and to you. Because God is the powerful and almighty Savior that we serve. Somebody put your hands together up in this place. You see, my goal is to live godly. I mess up. I do some stupid stuff in my life. I need to sit down somewhere sometime in my life. 
But to thank God that I remember 1 John 1 and 9, that if I confess my sin, that he is faithful and just to forgive me of all my unrighteousness. So I do what Bob Carlisle did. I do what Don McClurkley did. I get back up again. I fall down, but I get up. I fall down. I get up. 